You have fallen into Event Horizon with John Michael Godier. In today's episode, John is joined by Stephen Benner. Stephen Benner heads the Foundation for Applied Molecular Evolution, which he founded after serving on faculty at Harvard, ETH Zurich, and the University of Florida. His research combines two traditions in science, one from natural history and the other from physical sciences. His laboratory has been a leader in the field of synthetic biology, where it has redesigned DNA to better understand how these molecules work, generate new classes of diagnostics tools, and to open new avenues to disease therapy. Separately, he also created the field of paleogenetics. His work also guides NASA missions to search for alien life and how life originated. His most recent book is titled Life, the Universe and the Scientific Method. Before we start the interview, I want to tell you about this video's sponsor, Scentbird. Scentbird reached out to us and sent us this month's perfumes, each with their own unique and fresh scents. I especially loved Unconquered, with its hints of coconut milk and mandarin oranges. There was also Pink Sugar, which is like being enveloped in a cloud of cotton candy, with touches of vanilla and caramel. Truly delightful. And the best thing about Scentbird is just how you're able to choose designer fragrances every month. From perfumes to colognes, Scentbird reimagines how you can discover, find and experience fragrances. And with each fragrance, you get a 30 day supply, so you can try them out before committing to a full sized bottle. Scentbird is the perfect gift for your partner or for yourself. And if you're just unsure of what you like, you can discover new fragrances by taking the simple quiz on Scentbird. Then, based on your preferences, Scentbird will help you find that perfect fragrance that fits just who you are. Make sure to use EV55 to get 55% off your first month at Scentbird. Click the link in the description below, and by doing so, you're directly supporting Event Horizon. Thank you. Remember to subscribe to Event Horizon so you never miss an episode. Dr. Stephen Benner, welcome to the program. Thank you. Now, Doctor, the the science of astrobiology, which is the science we haven't yet seen an example to <laughs> to study yet other than ourselves, is is really moving in a different direction than it was. And it seemed to me that the thinking for a very long time was that this abiogenesis must be impossibly complex and it's probably very rare in the universe and, and that was sort of the mode of thinking but that's sort of changing especially with this recent paper that you co-authored regarding volcanic glass and RNA formation which seems to suggest that maybe it's not so complicated. What's your view? Do you really think that we should really be looking for a simpler answer to this question than what we've been looking at for years now? Well, that's right. I mean, the Astrobiology Institute at NASA was started because in 1996, they found structures inside of a meteorite that had come from Mars, landed on Antarctica, and they cracked it open and looked at with, with ultra microscopy and saw these things. And the story is, of course, is that the President of the United States and Bill Clinton went to the head of NASA, Dan Golden, and said, is this life or isn't it? And the answer was, well, we don't know. At which point the question was, well, what, what are we paying you for, right? NASA is the agency such that exists solely for the pur purpose that when aliens right, contact us, we have somebody ready to talk to them. And so here, microbial life may have been found. And uh, so at NASA, astrobiology went after it. But you're right. I mean, there is the joke about exobiology, which is the predecessor for astrobiology, which is just the only science without a subject matter. <laughs> so, <laughs> but never mind. Absolutely. So the question about origins is within the purview of NASA. It's in the purview of NASA statutorily, right? We're supposed to figure out how life emerged and one of your problems and you can find these problems expressed very well on many many creationist web sites is that there's an irreducible complexity issue right you can't get complex molecules like genetic molecules and uh, without having an intelligent designer and rna ribonucleic acid which is thought to be the first genetic molecule it certainly 
can be a genetic molecule. Uh, the coronavirus that is infecting us with COVID is a RNA informational system. And so the problem with RNA is it looks like a very, very complicated molecule. And so it looks it looked for a long time like there was no way to get it without somebody standing there and controlling the reactions. I mean, part of the issue you all you understand if you ever go into a kitchen, right? There's something called the tar paradox. If you take organic material and you put energy into it, it doesn't all of a sudden come alive. Rather, it sort of decomposes. And the way you can see this, if you cook with sugar, right? Sugar is able to caramelize. If you heat solutions of it, it turns brown and then eventually black. And more useful for paving roads than sparking life. And ribose, which is the R in RNA, is a sugar. And in 1996, I think it was, uh, Stanley Miller, who is actually well known in this community because he's the guy who really started modern probiotic chemistry by sparking stuff, electricity through gases and getting amino acids formed. I mean, Miller said that ribose falls apart and therefore it will never ever uh, be part of a prebiotic scheme. And that's quite the depressing if somebody has uh, RNA as, as their view of the first genetic molecule, no ribose, no R, no R, no genetic molecule. So a lot of people have cast about for more complex solutions to this, right? One of which is to assume that maybe some other compound may be more stable, may be more accessible to chemistry without intelligent guidance. Maybe that molecule preceded RNA and then RNA and then DNA emerged later. But, you know, about 20 years ago, we started asking the question as to what would happen if you start putting some of these chemicals, which you know are made, on early earth in the presence of rocks that you know are present on the early earth. And the first thing we discovered was that, you know, ribose becomes quite stable if you have it in the presence of minerals that are containing the element boron. The element boron is known to you in your uh, kitchen or in your clothes washing operation as part of borax. And of course, these are uh, minerals that contain boron, which very much likes to bind to carbohydrates like ribose and other sugars and stabilize them. And so that really solved the tar paradox with respect to R, the ribose. But the, the, the report that you just mentioned sort of is at the other end of the scheme. If we, we thought, you know, getting to nucleosides, the building blocks of RNA was going to be hard, but we really thought it would be extremely hard would be getting from those building blocks to long chains of RNA that might have enough information in them to support, you know, Darwinian evolution, to spark Darwinian evolution to get it started. And it turns out if you just pour it on basaltic volcanic glass, the RNA forms pretty much spontaneously without much intelligent design. You mix the glass with the building blocks, you go away for a couple of weeks and you've made RNA on the support. And then there's a couple of things that your, your listeners may or may not be familiar with, but there is a kinds of volcanic rocks. The basalt is what you find, for example, in Iceland, which is coming from deep in the earth. On early earth, the entire earth was covered by basalt. In fact, there's really a little else on the surface of the early earth except basalt. And if you go to Mars, you can see the basalt on the surface of Mars. So yes, I mean, your point about simplicity as opposed to complexity, RNA looks like a complex molecule, but when you put RNA with rocks that were likely present on the early Earth, it seems like it's not all that complex after all. So essentially obsidian. Now this seems to be a an eminently repeatable, easy experiment to produce RNA in this method. I mean, yes. has, have other people actually done this and seen RNA coming up? Yeah. Let me correct one word. You said obsidian. <laughs> now that is a volcanic glass, which perhaps you have seen in jewelry stores and various other places, but that tends to be not from basalt types of material, but from more processed ah. or silica type material. So you got to keep in mind that on earth, there's been a lot of churning continental drift, subduction, volcanoes, you know about them by looking at the ring of fire and Mount St. Helens, among other things. And so what happens is that it's actually very hard to get on the modern earth. If I go outdoors here in Florida, for example, I don't see any basalt anywhere. What I see is limestone. And, uh, and that's, of course, coming from the processing of the soil by plate tectonics. One of the reasons why Mars is so interesting 
is because there has not been so much plate tectonics. So a lot of the very, very primitive crust is still available to us. So, so yes, but that's, that's a minor detail. So absolutely. So, you know, we have uh, gotten these basalt samples, the basalt glass come from the U S geological survey, which is uh, providing them as reference samples. So we've got a few grams. So we did a bunch of these experiments and then, Steve, me, that is, wants to distribute kits to high school students because if they can reproduce it, right, the whole premise of prebiotic chemistry is that even a professor, it's so simple, even a professor can do it, right? But even a high school student should be able to do it. But we went back to the USGS to get now a large amount of this glass to distribute it, and they were no longer distributing it. They had problems with COVID, and then the guy retired, and the staff was not there. So I just made a trip to Iceland last month and I brought back about 50 pounds of <laughs> basalt volcanic glass, which we're now trying to prepare kids to distribute. So we'll send you one if you'd like. Sure. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, that would be fascinating, uh, especially as somebody that's, that's spent the last 35 years interested in abiogenesis and then all of a sudden RNA is appearing. <laughs> Which yeah. really, I mean, think about the, the implications of that. If it's that simple to get RNA going, now, of course, there's going to be a bunch of steps in between, and then you got to get to DNA and all this stuff. But just the idea of RNA sets up the RNA world. And this must happen everywhere in the universe very commonly. I mean, we could infer that, couldn't we? Well, that, that's right. I, I, I you got to keep in mind that a big part of my career has been doing chemical synthesis. I'm an organic chemist by training where we make molecules and that are not found naturally. So if you read my book, Life, the Universe, and the Scientific Method, which is available from us, or I think it's on Amazon, the um, point here is that when you try to understand the distribution of life in the cosmos and the frequency of life in the cosmos, you have to do experiments indirectly to assess that probability because you're not at any time soon going to do Star Trek warp drive to go actually do a serious search for life in the cosmos. The most we're going to do is search for life on Mars. And NASA has, for institutional reasons, so we say, been very, very hesitant to make a mission to actually search for extant life on Mars. So, but you can go back into the laboratory and say, hey, wait a minute, so DNA can evolve, it can store information, RNA can do so, those are natural examples, but can we as synthetic chemists make other molecule systems that can store information, evolve, be replicated, mutate, and so on? And the answer is yes, we can. And uh, this has been very important to us because we can make DNA analogs that have six nucleotide letters in them, or eight or 10 or 12, um, and we can show that these evolve and can store information. So in the laboratory, we're able to get a wide diversity of structures. We can make this stuff without ribose in it. We can make it with other sugars. We can make it with other uh, backbones. And so the chemists, the synthetic biologists, as we like to call ourselves, are able to show molecules other than RNA or DNA and so we had been tending in the direction of saying, well, yeah, we go to Vulcan or, or any place in the cosmos where we encounter life. It was not necessary to have it be RNA like the molecule that we know or DNA like the molecule that we know. But what you're absolutely right. What is universal in rocky planets formation? They're all going to be made from iron, silica, oxygen, these basic principal elements when they are forming the iron is going to sink to the core and the surface is going to contain minerals that are like the salt that's very universal they're all going to very quickly get to the point where the volcanoes are outgassing hydrogen in the form of water nitrogen in the form of elemental nitrogen carbon in the form of carbon dioxide and most importantly sulfur in the form of sulfur dioxide that's going to be universal and depending on where you are relative to the sun uh, or the star in the case of the galaxy, you're going to find the same kind of chemistry that is getting a little bit of boron, making a little bit of stuff. And when you make stuff with boron, you make ribose, five carbon sugars more than other things. And so all of a sudden the work with origins 
especially minerals involved in origins, especially given the universality of rocky planets and this, the basic elements that are forming them, you're all of a sudden saying that, wait, wait a minute, you in the laboratory are actually getting much more diversity than we would get if we just let rocks and carbon interact with each other naturally. So you're absolutely right. So then it, it, there actually is a reason why you might expect Vulcans to have DNA and that you might expect a Vulcan male to be able to mate with a human female and produce Spock. So, I mean, we had always said, you know, previous to this last couple of years that that would be completely ridiculous because Vulcan DNA would have six different nucleotides and then human DNA and four, and they would be certainly incompatible molecularly, even if they were compatible socially. Now, could you do it uh, artificially? <laughs> In other words, say you meet an alien civilization and you want to reproduce with it, could you do it with genetic artificiality and sort of create well, a custom DNA fusion of the two? No, <laughs> briefly. Well, first place, you don't, if you divergently evolve such that a chimpanzee and a human, I'm not going to get into that. Maybe I should not use those as the two examples. But if you divergently evolve such, you have a sheep and a and an ox, right? Those two animals have diverged within the last 20 million years or so. So Mr. Sheep and Mrs. Ox or vice versa do not make reproductive offspring. The same example is with a horse, right? And a donkey, they diverged five million years ago, mere eye blink on the geological scale and their offspring, the mules are possible but they're sterile and so you know the idea that you're going to have a Vulcan and a human mate synthetically requires matching in a, uh, in a well at least if you're if, 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 if you have two chromosomes <laughs> so, I, mean, I mean again this becomes uh, I mean people have written the book the biology of Star Trek and you can go back and read some of the things that they have to say about it but you're not going to get a productive molecular fusion uh with leading to molecular replication with molecular offspring of course there will be cultural fusion uh, will that satisfy you perhaps i i would certainly like to meet an alien but to be honest with you i would like to do it at a distance like with a distant radio signal <laughs> but uh the um uh, the idea of, of an alien species actually being here is a little bit tricky because they're probably of higher technology than we are, and that never goes well. Well, it only goes well. I mean, what part of the word fiction don't you understand? Yeah. But, but the side point here is that there is, of course, the possibility that you do have a shadow biosphere here on Earth. That is, we the way we look for life on Earth is making the assumption that the life is very much chemically like us. But, you know, we it just found, I mean, Philippe Marlier and a few other people just found a couple about a year ago of a, a, a life form in the oceans that does not use the four nucleotides that you use or I use, that G, A, C, and T are the four bases in our RNA, but rather it replaces the A with another letter. And, and so the minute you do that, the way the tools that you have to look for that life are less efficient in finding that life and of course if the shadow biosphere here on earth living under our feet perhaps is sufficiently different in terms of its molecular structure you would miss it if you went looking for it in the way that we look for it that's also the problem with with uh, with life on mars right even if it is driven in origins to be very similar by the mineralogy as the origins that were driven on Earth, we have a billion to three or four billion years separated. And so then what the life went out and did evolving in its own environment, in its own milieu, might end up at a very different point. But, you know, it's kind of amusing. So, I mean, you go to Australia, you, you've run this experiment on Earth, right? There has been mammalian evolution on Australia independent of mammalian evolution in say north america and what you find is of course remarkable differences where the kinds of behavioral statements that you make about life have converged so we have carnivores in north america we have carnivores in australia we have you know herbivores in both places but you know the way in which mammalian evolution solved universal problems is quite different now regarding the shadow biosphere does this finding of RNA generation change that equation? Meaning that, you know, the question is, was there a second day biogenesis or a third or a fourth on Earth? But if this is the path to RNA, does, does 
RNA arising in basaltic glasses suddenly simply become food for the pre-existent biosphere and the situation is that whoever's first wins no that's that's a that's an excellent question and the short answer i always fall back on the four most important words in science i do not know so yes the argument for second genesis and third genesis is that if you get genesis and then you're able to evolve you're going to be a better thing than the second Genesis down the street. And so you're going to eat it. And that's one of the arguments. What we know is that the molecular record of life today is inadequate to settle that question and not even close. So all organisms on earth are related by common ancestry that we know of, leaving aside the question of shadow biosphere. And these all diverge well after evolution was well on its way and proteins had been invented and many, many things were going on. So the argument would be, yes, if there were an RNA world organism surviving on Earth, it would have to be in a very special niche, say one which is very rich in phosphorus, very poor in sulfur, very spatially confined are the kinds of things that we have written about. Uh, and so as to allow it to compete on the same planet with the likes of people like you, right, who are inclined to eat it. So the, yeah, so it's an interesting point. There is, however, conceivable that you would have the same, you also have more than one species on earth, right, where they don't eat each other because they are adapted to different niches. And so they get along just fine. And that could very well be the case with a different fundamental molecular biochemistry. So you could imagine, you know, some organism emerging in colder basalt and someone emerging in warmer basalt. And they might be adapted separately for their two environments. And then the only question would be at some point going down the road, do they intermix? And, you know, they have the same problem with human evolution, right? Humans and Neanderthals and Denisovans diverged and, but you know, they went into different niches, but then when they encountered each other, as far as we can tell, they intermix. And so you end up having a lineage that's common with both of them together in some form. So we can find pieces of Neanderthal DNA in your genome. So yeah, I, 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 it's, it, what you can say about the independent origins is that you're right. If there's basalt everywhere on earth, and if it's this simple, then you really do expect multiple origins geographically separate. And then the only question would be, what, what do they ever come in contact or does one of them, you know, all of a sudden get hit by a meteorite and never go away for that reason. And all of that is quite speculative. Now in the field, you know, you're, you're going to Iceland and you're, and you're looking at the basaltic uh, glasses. Could you perform this experiment in the field and see if RNA is arising still to this day on Earth on a constant basis? And yeah. can we do that on Mars? Well, there, there you go. There you, you've already jumped one head, step ahead of me. Absolutely. I mean, I, I went to Iceland and the first thing I did was just, it's very useful to get a chemist out of the laboratory to actually look at rocks because it's actually quite a different environment than a test tube. Um, we, I just put a piece up on primordialscoop.org, which is our blog showing some pictures of some of these rocks. And so you can actually see what you're dealing with. But the problem in Iceland is that the, the place where I collected is a lava flow that really was continuing to flow until September of last year. So it's maybe six months cool, but already the biosphere on earth has invaded it. But yeah, on Mars, you know, it's a, it's a, it, it's, you know, even let's say there is no biosphere on Mars, but there is still carbon dioxide on the surface of Mars. Admittedly, the Martian atmosphere, a, a big part of this, what we call the discontinuous synthesis model for making prebiotic RNA does require a reducing atmosphere. That reducing atmosphere is more likely, well, it's a created by impacts that are delivering molten iron to the surface. Mars hasn't had one of those impacts for some time, but certainly pieces of this should be working on the basalt of Mars. And you could run the experiment there if you insisted upon it, because on Iceland, if I start pouring RNA or building blocks for RNA on the basalt surface, they're gonna get eaten.
Now that's that's interesting because couldn't you do uh, well? It would be it wouldn't be the same experiment, but it'd be a variant of the labeled release experiment. So you yes. <laughs> you could maybe go to Mars and try to detect uh, RNA getting eaten. No, I mean, look, the variant the label release experiment. I uh, as uh, I mean, my book, you know, I talk about this at great length. It is it is a cultural statement, not a scientific one that. Mars uh, has no life on it. Certainly, Gil Levin, the label release experiment, the fixation of carbon, the, the Norm Horowitz experiment, these were done in Viking 1976, and they were net positive. The uh, only reason why the mission concluded with the statement that life could not be found on Mars is because another experiment was run looking for organic material, a gas chromatography mass spectrometry experiment. If you're listeners are interested and they they that gcms claim did not find organic materials on mars now my only contribution to this was 20 years later in 1999 i wrote a paper pointing out that that experiment could not find organic molecules on mars if it was sitting on a pile of them then we explained what mars and organics would be found on mars this was benzoic acid is one of them I mean, Gil Levin immediately said, well, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I had these positive results. And then they were thrown out because of this experiment. And Benner has just pointed out this experiment was wrongly interpreted. So why are we not back to my positive results? And for 20 years, even today, you can go pick them. NASA just had a, a workshop last year trying to define standards for the detection of alien life. And the workshop opens with uh, it's a premise justifying its existence by saying that well the results on mars were falsely interpreted as positive and we need standards to keep from making that mistake again now the problem was that the viking experiments the mistake was that they missed they, they were too invested in the idea of not finding life that they took a poorly interpreted experiment an experimental result that trumped the um, uh, the correct experiment so yeah i mean the label release experiment still stands as a life detection affirmative signal and the problem is that the culture i mean my paper came 20 years too late right because after a while once you start saying that life is not possible before it's cause organic molecules are not possible on the surface of mars you come to believe it it gets into textbooks it gets into the culture and so even now there's guys trotting around the surface of mars with rovers and, you know, a year ago, they finally got a sample, which they got on the dunes. They had assumed that there was no organics in it, but one of their instruments was broken. So they had some time to look for organics. And guess what they found? Well, they found organics, including benzoic acid, which 20 years earlier had been predicted. So you're looking at NASA's exploration of Mars as a cultural issue, right? They, 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 <laughs> the label release experiment was possible, positive. They misinterpreted the experiment did the misinterpretation of data throw out the label release experiment and then for 40 years have been afraid to go looking for life on Mars. It's, it's, it's really a cultural description that movies should be made. It really is. And I had the uh, privilege of interviewing Dr. Patricia Ann Stratt yeah, before yeah, she sure. passed away. Yeah, and, sure. um, and she was convinced to the very end that that, that, that experiment had seen something. And I'm, I'm inclined to agree because I think it was kind of dismissed because of um, it can't be therefore it isn't you know type of thinking but you should just pull back and take an objective look at it freshly you know and i wish somebody would do that with a labeled release experiment and maybe repeat it on mars but there's still hesitancy it's getting better but there's still hesitancy within the culture of nasa against direct life detection and i think it's probably because it's just so easy to for somebody to come along and question it you, you know do you think that's the problem it's just too easily <laughs> open for question well that's one way of looking at it I mean, I, I, of course, I'm good friends with the people who run NASA headquarters and, and that we talk about this in 2019, right before COVID, Mike Meyer, who is a, a, one of the NASA headquarters people responsible for Mars, did hold a meeting in Carlsbad, New Mexico, talking about how to search for extant life on Mars. We thought, hey, now finally the culture is going to change. Um, keep in mind that the only reason I realized that there was this problem was because in 1999, actually the same Michael Meyer dragged me down to re referee NASA 
grant applications in the Lunar and Planetary Institute in Texas and Houston. And I had the evening to read the Mars mission logs, which are on the shelves in there. And you read it from the perspective of an organic chemist, and all of a sudden you realize that, well, they're just making assumptions. They're wrong. But, you know, as you read it, the logs, some of the emotions are coming through. So when they have the label release experiments and the Harwitz experiments, and they're all sort of positive, everybody is, you could say the sentiment was not excitement. The, the, the sentiment was fear, right? Because if I declare life, I found life on Mars, my life going forward is much more difficult than if I say there is no life, right? So all of a sudden you'll get the public interest of people like you will start, hey, this is exciting. And, and, but it's much easier to say, hey, there is no life. But when the, the mass spec experiment came through and that sort of ruled out life, right? The, Mar the Mars program shut down. People were fired. People lost their job. People went elsewhere. The entire thing just went away in a matter of months. And so NASA headquarters and there are people you can talk to there think that the Viking mission was a failure and that they should not have life detection for the fear of disappointing the public. And that's fine. But the result is that they are spending a lot of money to fly drones, for example, on the surface of Mars to establish where, whether we can fly or not. Well, OK, that's fine. Uh, they're spending a lot of time on Mars looking for geological things, looking for past evidence of life. But there are layers of ice just subsurface on Mars. These are getting there by dust storms and various changes in the Martian orbital obliquity and all the rest of it. But the point is, if the ice were on Earth, it would be in holding organisms. So, and because of synthetic biology, because we've made a lot of different kinds of DNA, we know how to look for the general DNA, not just. Um, and so synthetic biology for 20 years has told NASA how to look agnostically for life on Mars. It's we know where to look agnostically for life on Mars. And now that we are doing experiments with basalt and borax and these other things showing that uh, the formation of RNA is quite a natural phenomenon of interactions of organics with rocks. We've given them the incentive to look for life on Mars, but you know, they're still not looking for life on Mars. Now, there was a workshop just that was run by a former student of mine actually, uh, um, and you know, to try to get engineering coupled to chemistry in the life detection things. And they're saying, well, we're going to look for life in 20 years. Okay. Well, okay. As we say, for 20 years ago, synthetic biology told them how to look. We know where to look. We have a good chance of finding if we look. And so now we're talking about getting a committee together to talk about looking for life in 20 years. And I can understand how Patricia, I, I got to know Gil very well, not much better than Patricia, but um, you know, the question is, what, what the heck? I mean, here we are sitting here with the opportunity of the century, and we're not seizing it. Now, you mentioned your book, so I, I want to point everybody in that direction. Life, the Universe, and the Scientific Method by Stephen Benner. It's available over on Amazon. Now, the other thing here is that shouldn't, if there is life on Mars, and we're talking about both privately and through NASA of putting human feet on Mars, Shouldn't we know about any life that's there before we do that? Uh, yeah, I mean, I have a fellow working with me named Jan Spacek, and he and I have written some pieces on the primordialscoop.org. And we think, yes, it's very important to go and look for life before human habitation becomes widespread. But you got to keep in mind that almost all missions planned to Mars for humans involves what we call in situ resource utilization. And what we mean by that is we want to mine the water on Mars so as to create from it hydrogen and oxygen. That's being done by electrolysis using the energy from the sun. Um, the hydrogen is being used to reduce carbon dioxide, which comes from the atmosphere, to make methane. And I'm sure if you've been watching the SpaceX Raptor rockets, these are methane oxygen fueled things. And so you want to send to Mars water mining operations robotically to start making propellant for the return mission 
a year, two, or three ahead of humans landing on Mars. Now, our whole point is that we have a whole project called an Agnostic Life Finder, which has the convenient acronym ALF. Uh, for those of you who are old and remember the television show, that has meaning for the young people. It does not. But you will be able to sit astride a water mining operation on Mars, SpaceX's water mining operation, as they are mining liters and liters of water to generate propellant in advance of the astronaut arising and survey that water for sparse life within it. Again, because of synthetic biology, we know how to look for the universal life in that, in that milieu. And again, that's a, that's a, a process. I mean, the, the water ice is sampling the entire planet. You don't have to do sample return where you have to be very careful about which rock you pick up, right? And you're looking at the whole accessible surface in this water. And uh, if there's gonna be life there, um, it's going to be detected in the process of mining the water in preparation for um, um, uh, fuel uh, propellant generation for the return trip. So absolutely, I mean, I, I mean, I, Elon is uh, still getting, I guess, well, I guess right now he's buying Twitter, but if we get him to focus on his the mission, he should put together as a very low cost add-on, an ALF, an alien life finder or agnostic life finder in on the mining operation as they prepare for human visits. That would be amazing if, if, if it was detected privately, completely without NASA and just through the efforts of SpaceX. Now, um, other bodies in the solar system that evoke this uh, basaltic uh, glass, what of the moon? Is there a layer in the moon warm enough for water and has basalt that might have something going on deep below? Yeah, I, the four most important words in science, I, I do not know. But keep in mind that the idea that moon is, 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 uh, is uh, formed from the remnants of an impact on Earth it is not, by the way, anywhere near as basaltic as the Earth. It's much more silica. So if you'll pardon the analogy, it's much more like obsidian. Um, and it's uh, not large enough to have a reasonably interesting gravitational attraction. And therefore, it's not large enough to ever have had an atmosphere where liquid water is running. Mars is much, much better than this. In fact, even on Mars, there is occasionally liquid water most likely at places. So m the moon is a hard slog here. I, I'm not looking forward to finding life on the moon. Now, what of the ice shell moons like Europa and Enceladus? Could this process even happen there? Or if you're going to have an abiogenesis there, it needs to happen through a completely different process involving, you know, a hydrothermal vent or something like that. Is it yeah. is is the sort of things, the conditions that could have caused a abiogenesis on Earth or Mars, um, outright not really likely on the ice shell moons. No, I'm with you. I mean, one of the nice things about science is, is you get to attack your own theories, okay? So there are a couple of things that which we would mention. One of the ways in which one doesn't believe that our model would work is if the entire Earth were submerged under a global ocean. And the reason for that is because any chemistry that you do to get yourself towards making RNA, if it's then washed and diluted into a global ocean, the work has been uh, lost. And so there are some geologists who do think that early Earth was a water world. And so that one of the ways in which they criticize our approach, and I mean, it's a perfectly reasonable criticism, is to say, well, the Earth was flooded. Now, of course, Mars never had the surface water inventory that earth had so mars actually would then be the place to go to do the chemistry that elisa and hyojun and various people here have done the question now for europa is okay what's quite clear is that the chemistry that we're describing requires among other things dry land so that you don't lose productive work into a global ocean dilution um, and the second thing it does require is access of the surface intermittently irrigated uh, to a, an atmosphere that is reduced by an impact. 
And uh, the, in Earth, we actually know that those impacts occurred. Uh, clearly, the one that formed the moon was a huge impact. It made lava oceans on the surface of the Earth. It blew material into space. Nothing that emerged by way of chemistry, let alone life, survived that impact. Then there were smaller impacts, um, series size, Vesta size. So by the time you get down to Vesta size impacts, they are reducing the atmosphere in a way that is productive for the prebiotic formation of RNA without sterilizing the surface. So now that's the model. But of course, Europa, now if it's always flooded, if it never has access to an atmosphere with reduced organics generated after an impact, the model doesn't work on Europa. You do need to have dry land. So, so Europa is a bit of an issue. Of course, then you go out farther to Saturn and there's the moon Titan. Now, Saturn's moon is Titan is covered with organic molecules. The problem that you have there is it's cold. <laughs> so every organic molecule that contains everything, anything like nitrogen or oxygen is so cold, it freezes and solidifies in the bottom. And so it never reacts. And so with Titan, we tried to create alternative genetic systems as synthetic biologists in Titan. And it's actually very hard to get anything to work at those low temperatures. So, but a warm Titan would be more interesting, but of course the warm Titan comes in closer, which means that you have a different ratio of elements accreting. And so you have a hard time getting as much hydrocarbon. So these types of things are at that level, Earth to Mars is very nice in terms of rocky planets. And that's also goes for extrasolar planets. Now, Venus, right? You go into the sun. Now there's rocky planets there and Venus early on perhaps did this chemistry as well. But, you know, when you're that close to the sun and, you know, you get a greenhouse effect going and you tend to become, you know, quite acidic. And, of course, Venus has a lot of sulfuric acid in the clouds in the atmosphere. So if there's organic chemistry there, it's very different from what it is here if it's supporting life. And But that's one of the fun things. I mean, Jan Spacek, who I've already mentioned, had a had a wonderful set of ideas about the organic chemistry that is going on in Venus. And so as synthetic biologists, we went back and have had a look at it. And, you know, Venus chemistry could very well support life if I am very imaginative, but it does not support the origins uh, that we're presently being talking about on these more rocky planets with more water. So, Doctor, we go out. And we, we start exploring the rocky planets of the solar system, and we find at least one other occurrence of microbial life, let's say Mars. Now, people are going to try to make the argument, well, it was probably either Earth life or Mars life, and that panspermia, they, they contaminated each other. But is the genetic evidence just going to be so overwhelmingly um, supportive of either panspermia or complete separate abiogenesis that it'll be easy to tell? Or will this be a debate that rages for years after the discovery? Well, the debate will certainly rage, but that's a, that's a general statement of how science works. It's very important to have raging debates. But take one step back. We actually, we put a piece up on primordialscoop.org about, about a year ago on this subject. Your, what the, the logic will be to do a molecular analysis, a molecular dissection, and look for similarities and differences. One of the nice things about Gil Levin's advanced experiment, his advanced label release experiment, which, which he did not run because there was not enough money and space on the mission to accommodate it, is to put left-handed and right-handed food onto the surface of Mars. And so if I put left-handed and right-handed food onto you, you exhale carbon dioxide from it in different ratios, depending on whether the food is left-handed or right-handed. Um, and so what would be quite clear is if the uh, handedness, that is, of the molecules that are found on Mars and the genetic molecules, or let's say proteins, were the opposite of what it is on Earth, it would be very hard to imagine a continuous evolution of one from the other which would imply independent genesis of the two, once on Mars and once on Earth. But yes, you're absolutely right. If you start seeing similar DNA structures, similar RNA structures, you're going to say, oh, okay, well, that's because maybe independent genesis, but maybe the control 
by rocks was so strong that of course you got the same molecules. But then if you start looking at how you do things downstream metabolically, and if they are using similar structures, you're going to start saying, well, hey, maybe there was intercourse between Earth and Mars and life moved one way or the other. And that's why uh, they have similar. So my, my, one, of, one of the entertaining examples we use is you go look at your vitamin pills. Okay. The vitamin pills have uh, are, are providing you with uh, units that you're using to catalyze certain steps in your metabolism, the burning of sugar, or the fixing you know, synthesis of fatty acids. There's, there's a whole bunch of stuff that you do with these vitamins. Now, those vitamins have what we, molecular structures that are, as we use the word, contingent, right? They are weird. Part of it is necessary for chemical reactivity, but part of it is just accidental, all right? And so if I start seeing the vitamin pills sold in a Martian grocery store have the same structure as the vitamin pills sold in the Earth grocery store, I'm going to start saying that, you know, Earth and Mars life diverged much more recently than 4 billion years, maybe 1 billion years. And of course, the more the similarities get, the more the similarities are contingent, that is, the more that the similarities appear to reflect historical accident rather than rocks and elements and natural chemistry, the more you begin to say that, hey, the Martian and Earth life are related. And of course, if they're very, very similar, such that you're able to sequence DNA from both Martian and Earth organisms, and they fit into an evolutionary tree that is describing the Earth biosphere, sooner or later, you're going to begin to say to yourself, hmm, maybe they diverged recently because humankind brought them on the last spacecraft. And that's, of course, an uninteresting result. Now, my, my next question for you gets into synthetic biology, because obviously we can look for abiogenesis on other worlds, natural abiogenesis. But how close is the field of synthetic biology to creating abiogenesis in the test tube? Well, yeah, I mean, this is, of course, back to the work that starts this conversation. So, so we, we, we're surprised at how easily RNA is assembled from building blocks by the salts. But one of the weaknesses of the model is that we are actually all using right-handed building blocks. In principle, we should have both left-handed and right-handed building blocks and um, made by the chemistry that goes before involving borax, for example. And uh, that's actually one of the big weaknesses of the model, right? I don't have a good idea as to how we get only one handedness of molecules out of borax moderated chemistry. Now, the question about abiogenesis is a subtle question because you have to decide what you mean. Right, I'm assuming that you do not mean that the formation of RNA equals a biogenesis of life, right? Right, yes. Now let's just say this is just the beginning uh, okay, so the formation of RNA. And I'm, then right. then we get to DNA, how that happens. And I Well, guess yeah, let's not even get to DNA. Let's just get to Darwinian evolution from a hands-off level, right? So. I am allowed to give you RNA if I can make it a biologically. And then the paradox, the problem has moved, right? A year ago, two years ago, the problem was getting RNA. Well, we got RNA. Now the problem is getting RNA with all building blocks from right-handed building blocks or all left-handed building blocks. But that actually is not the big paradox associated with abiogenesis at this point. Right now, the problem is how do you, I'll give you RNA, okay, now get, get life, okay? And that's where the experiment now becomes a problem, right? But, you know, it's, uh, don't get me wrong. I mean, it's much easier to tackle the problem of abiogenesis once I give you RNA than it is without it. In fact, the abiogenesis problem was focusing earlier in the pathway. Now it gets a chance to focus later. So that's a good question. So uh, how close are we? I mean, this is the usual answer is 42, right? <laughs> right. It's a number 
without units. So that means I did not answer your question. But absolutely, the, the, the goal now, and then Jerry Joyce at, 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 the, at the Scripps Research Institute in La Jolla has been trying to ask what kind of evolution he can get given RNA. And all of a sudden, that is becoming much more relevant to the questions of origins of life. It was completely irrelevant to the origins of life before he could get RNA in the first place. But if we give him RNA, now all of a sudden the experiments he's been doing with Wojtek and Tracy and all the other people who are working with him become quite relevant because now your question is given RNA, can you get out of it a system's behavior that you as a skeptic would call biology, specifically Darwinian evolution? And you know, that's a lot closer. Well, it is. It's a huge leap because the big question was, well, how do you get the RNA world? If that is indeed how this happened, how do you get it? And now it appears the answer was remarkably simple. So maybe well, <laughs> it, I, I, that simplicity at, might continue. <laughs> well, well, we can hope. But keep in mind that we do need to worry about left-handed and right-hand molecules to take the next step before RNA. Now, but uh, granted, if you can solve that particular problem and you can get nucleotides 100 to 200 uh, building blocks long. Um, I mean, some of the things that Jerry works with, or Jerry Joyce we're referring to here at, at Scripps, are 100 to 200 nucleotides long. In fact, a lot of them are shorter. But if you can get RNA building blocks built from the same handedness of building blocks and hand them off to Jerry, I'm going to retire and let Jerry finish the story because now it's a question as to how do you get Darwinian evolution arising spontaneously given RNA to begin with. Now, you got to keep in mind that there are issues there. So the, the, uh, we, we focus on paradoxes. I just love doing this. We try to find problems that really say, hey, it can't work. So here's one of your ways of looking at that. If I give you RNA molecules, I can get catalysts out of them. It's quite easy to do. It's been done now for oh, 30 years. Jack Shostak, Larry Gold, Jerry himself, these people have done this. It is very easy to get out of a pool of random RNA sequences, RNA molecules that catalyze the destruction of RNA. It's a lot more difficult to get out of that random pool of RNA molecules that catalyze the formation of RNA. And so now you can sort of see the paradox emerging, right? Okay, great. Benner will give you all of the RNA that you want, all of the homochiral RNA that is built from all the same building blocks. Anything you want, 100 MERS, 200 MERS, but he's going to give it to you in an informationless system. That is, the sequences are going to be random. Now, each individual molecule has a sequence and therefore it contains information, but overall, the pool has no information. But within that pool are molecules that catalyze reactions including some that catalyze the formation of a copy of themselves, one of the essential steps for Darwinian evolution. But say there are 10 million or 100 million more molecules that catalyze the destruction of RNA. You can see the problem. I'm going to make many, many more destructive catalysts than I'm going to make constructive catalysts. And so that's a paradox which leaves you with the question, hey, this couldn't possibly uh, even even given Benner, even given Elisa Biondi handing you kilograms of RNA, right? Because destructive catalysts in those kilograms are more abundant than constructive catalysts, this will never give you life. Are you with me? Yep. So there you go. So that's a but that's a that's a fascinating question. It has to do with landscapes, right? So we call about landscapes is that say we go into what we call structure space. It's like walking across Colorado where you go up and you go down. The question is, if I go through a library of 10 to the 14th or 10 to the 15th molecules of random RNA sequence, what is the chances of my finding anything good or anything bad in that pool? So Elisa Biondi, who actually was the first author on this uh, paper with basalt glass, she's got some funding now from the National Science Foundation to ask exactly that kind of question. My last question for you is off the wall and doesn't really even uh, involve abiogenesis. Rather, it, it involves synthetic life in general and technologically creating it from the ground up. Do you think that we're very close to complex? 
custom microbial organisms that we can use for things like cleaning up oil spills and things like that, which I think we are. But by the same token, do you see any dangers to developing that kind of technology should it escape? No, I'm, I'm, I'm with you on this. I understand the question. First, of course, we are doing synthetic biology, shall we call it, of a different kind. That is, we're engineering microorganisms to do things for us. And of course, that's been going since you started to engineer the yeast to make wine, or uh, of course, that was not done deliberately. That's done by a natural process. And uh, it's also, we're also, uh, uh, of course, in for cleaning up oil spills, there's enough bacteria that have been exposed to oil naturally to have evolved systems which are able to degrade oil and they eat oil and uh, to generate some sort of a hybrid of those to put them into an environment. And, you know, recombinant DNA technology at the level of bacteria has not proven to be very, um, uh, we've been working on it for 50 years. It's been hard to find any example of, uh, of destruction or damage that has been uh, emerging. And the reason partly for that is because microbes themselves are out there doing a heck of a lot of evolution. And if I introduce my microbe into that ecosystem, my microbe gets eaten as a general rule. But, you know, it's an interesting problem. And I must say that this whole thing has been sparked again by this COVID origin. The coronavirus looks like at the level of genetics, it looks like it was human engineered in an experiment to try to understand how to um, get a virus that does not infect humans into one that does infect humans. And so it looks like they spliced in the furin cleavage site for that experiment. And of course, we now know that the experiment succeeded. Now, this virus is very curious. It presents in ways that are extremely unexpected for most uh, of the virus pandemics that we know of that where a virus has jumped a species. I mean, Middle East Respiratory Syndrome is another coronavirus. We know in that particular case that it jumped species from camels to humans without being human assisted. And so at some level, I, 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 I'm not as confident now as I was five years ago that, uh, that every evolution that we would do is uh, minor compared to all of the evolution that's going on out there naturally in a large population. So it's an interesting question that you ask. And I, uh, in general, we, we've had a lot of hard, it's been very, very difficult to find any example of any engineered microbe to do anything, you know, like you described, going wrong, because in general, in the environment, the competition, you know, drives them down. But this last, this last two, or two or three years has got me a little bit more concerned about that. And I think a lot more effort needs to be put into asking that question. Must take care. Now, one last thing. DNA SETI has been advanced within astrobiology that maybe somebody visited here long ago and changed the genome in some way that might be recognizably alien. And there was some claims from Russian scientists some years ago that maybe there might be something there. Have you ever seen any structure within the genomes of, of Earth that would lead you to believe that it's ever been messed with? Yeah. Okay. So I'm not sure which Russian experiment you're talking about, but it may be the one that I referred to earlier without mentioning the nationality there in the shadow biosphere area, there is a DNA in the bacteria phage. That is the viruses that infect bacteria, not just any bacteria. These are actually blue green bacteria that are cyanobacteria. They're photosynthetic bacteria. And there are viruses there which have a different kind of DNA. And that was what I, that, and that was a Russian work from the 1970s. It was picked up and studied very recently. Um, but uh, um, no, I mean, the, pretty much, it's, it's interesting. When people have gone back and looked at the fossil record, classical paleontology has constructed these trees of life that show the relationship of everything with everything else. Um, with the advent of DNA sequencing 30 years ago, People then went back and looked in great detail at the molecular structures of life. And what we found is pretty much that the molecular record pretty much tracks the classical paleontological record, indicating nobody going in and monkeying around, say, no alien Vulcan coming to do experiments on Earth. 
And this is also generally true in microbial systems. It's been very, very difficult to find examples where general processes of evolution seem to be working. Now, you got to keep in mind that the complexity of molecular evolution has gone far past just mutation, insertion, deletion, right? It's, there's all sorts of stuff going on, but none of it looks like it's anything that involves changing the structures of your genome prospectively. That is in anticipation of a future outcome. And that's what basically Darwinian evolution rules out. I mean, Darwinian evolution is not really a mechanism. It just has to have random changes with respect to future outcome. The changes otherwise don't have to be random, they can, but they just have to be, you just can't know in advance what you're going to, going to get when you make the change. But so the answer I think to your question is basically no, there's really not any evidence that I, I, I know of that says that there's anything particularly weird going on. All right, Doctor, we are out of time. Everybody should check out Dr. Benner's book, Life, the Universe, and the Scientific Method, and also the blog, primordialscoop.org. Thank you for joining us today, Doctor, and I hope you come back someday next time something new is found on this subject. Yeah. My pleasure. Thanks much. Thank you again to Scentbird for sponsoring this video. Click the link in the description below to support Event Horizon by using the code EV55 and you'll get 55% off your first month at Scentbird. Thank you. Event Horizon and my channel are now available as a podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube memberships. Early ad-free episodes, bonus episodes, and sleep-focused content. Sign up now by clicking the links below to your platform of choice.